Okay, that should be recording. Um, if you don't see the recording thing, give us a shout. Okay, so um, we've got to this point where we can sort of say, well, what we're assuming is about our data, oh, sorry, this equals shouldn't be there, but um, Y is sampled from a Gaussian with a zero mean and um, according to this covariance structure, which is this particular structure. Now, the thing I want you to notice about this structure, which is really fun, is it's actually a low rank structure. So this first matrix WW transpose is not full rank because it's a P by Q and Q is gonna be less than P because Q is less our um, latent dimensionality. So I said we had to mind P's and Q's. So WW transpose, when you see that, that's low rank. W transpose W would be full rank. But sigma is full rank because it's the diagonal, unless any of these are zero, unless the variance is a zero, as long as the variances aren't zero. So the interpretation of that is, you know, that the bit of your dimensionality reduction that's coming from the latent space is degenerate. It's not a full rank Gaussian, right? Um, it's not a properly defined Gaussian. It's only defined on this plane because what you're doing is you're basically taking a Gaussian in low Q dimensional space and then you're projecting it up, but you're only projecting up a Q dimensional Gaussian. So it's at rank most Q. So the noise term here, remember we had that little bit of noise on the manifold in the circle. The noise term here is ensuring that it's a properly defined distribution across the whole of the P space. Otherwise it would be defined only in subspace of Q. What does that mean? It means it's like a delta function that like it's saying zero probability for anything off the manifold, that like the data must only sit on the plane that is defined by W in a Gaussian distribution, which in somehow is, you know, is somehow a valid distribution, but quite difficult to fit. So the noise is sort of blurring that out and uh, allowing you to have off plane um, probability. Um, we haven't spoken much about the mean vector. If we add a mean to um, y, we can do that. So we can sort of say, well, let's just add um, a mean of mu. So if our data is not zero mean, and this is exactly the thing, George, uh, that I think was the, probably the error I made with the first rendering of that plot, which I've reused. Um, so I can add a mean mu and I can find the solution for mu by maximizing the likelihood of the data. So what does maximizing the likelihood um, uh, of the, um, the likelihood mean? It means that I maximized the probability of y under this distribution, right? So I maximize with respect to w, the parameters. So this isn't a probability distribution in the parameters. That's why it's called the likelihood function the term developed by Fisher to highlight that. The likelihood function is that um, this, this, this probability as a function of W, you maximize that. And then that makes Y your data more probable. And I can find the parameters that way. Now, if I add a mu in here, it just gives me a mean of mu in that Gaussian. And then the maximum likelihood solution for mu is just uh, a mean of the data. So what we typically do very often, not necessarily in our, our, our program, our algorithm, but in our maths, we just assume the data zero mean because then we don't have to carry this plus mu around all the place and it makes the maths easier. So, so please assume that on my behalf that I'm just gonna drop plus mu and assume that we're setting it to this. So, um, and the covariance remains the same. It's not affected by that. Okay, so I mentioned principal component analysis in this context, and it's, it's such an important model. And it goes actually back to 1933, a guy called Harold Hotelling, who was a mathematician who noticed that the social scientists were doing this. And he said a few interesting things. He said um, that they called these things factors, and he didn't want to use the term factor in his algorithm because factor has a specific mathematical meaning, as in um, when you're looking at a product. So um, I think that's interesting because the really interesting thing is that it is a factorization principal component analysis. There is some factorization going on. You're effectively factorizing the covariance matrix. 
into this low rank form. So I think it's a shame that he he didn't keep retain the name factor analysis um, uh, because people then think of this algorithm as so different from factor analysis. But the, the other thing he did is he took all these sigma i squares to zero. So um, he basically looked at the degenerate form. So he says, well, I'm gonna look at the case where the noise is zero. Um, so his, his probability was sample y from this, which is a degenerate Gaussian, as I was just saying. So that's got some nice characteristics in that it turns out when you do the maximum likelihood solution for W, that the W is, the, um, is a combination of the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of the covariance. We're gonna come back to that, but it's got some nasty features in that what you've developed is not a proper probability distribution. Any questions on that? Drop them in the chat. The chat's right in front of me. I'm even using, I'm blocking my slides with it so that if you put anything in there, I should see it. So this is the sort of the form of that likelihood. Now, actually in practice, we don't maximize these functions directly. So it's independent across the data. So this is the um, uh, product of this over the data is the full data likelihood. Um, and uh, we would typically optimize the log likelihood, not the likelihood itself, because the, the maxima for the likelihood and the log likelihood are coincident because log is monotonic. And the log likelihood is often a much easier form to maximize because it gets rid of these exponentials and turns products into sums and the sums are easier to do the gradient on. So we like, if there's something with products in, we like taking logs before we optimize because you find the same optima, but the gradients um, become somewhat easier. But it's a degenerate covariance. Um, so this is just a sort of review of the model that we're talking about, right? So this is just the component parts coming together and, you know, just using those rules of the multivariate Gaussians that give us the marginal likelihood. But when I was a PhD student, Mike Tipping was a postdoc and uh, he did this work. I mean, this, this is published in 1999, but he did it when I was at Aston. So the first part of my PhD with Chris Bishop, who was my supervisor, who moved to Microsoft Research. That's how I ended up in the computer lab. Um, and uh, Mike noticed an amazing thing that even if you don't take sigma squared to zero, if you allow, if you force sigma squared to be the same, so the noise is the same in all dimensions, then this system still has the same maximum likelihood solution. And this is amazing because this is like 66 years after her tellings done the first one. And, and Mike, who was just my friend at Aston, worked this out, it was super cool. It, it, I mean, I found it so inspirational as a PhD student, like a result that wasn't known like this. And, and it requires a little bit of manipulation. You can find it in this paper, it's beautifully described, but this is basically the solution for the maximum likelihood solution for, for this model. So the difference between this and Hotelling's model is Mike is not taking sigma squared to zero. Mike's keeping sigma squared finite. It works if sigma squared zero. And this is the form of the maximum likelihood solution. So this is the, the likelihood where the parameters that we're interested in are W, we're assuming zero mean, we're assuming you've subtracted the mean and sigma squared. And this is the log likelihood, which is the thing we maximize, right? And what Mike showed beautifully and elegantly, and I do remember uh, he had to, we moved to Cambridge, we both moved to Cambridge around the time he was doing this. And he had to go to the university library here because it was the only source for some paper he needed to reference in his Royal Statistical Society paper. Um, he showed that if this is your log likelihood here in the blue box, now, this looks complex, but it's actually reasonably simple. This object here is the covariance matrix of the data. So it's one over N times Y transpose Y. And remember Y is mean centered. So we've subtracted the mean. Now, if you work this out, play with this in your own time, you'll see that that form, and it's why I like matrices because you get these forms that are easy to manipulate that are the covariance. This object is the covariance. So basically this trace term here, which is a way of rewriting that uh, quadratic, um, term that comes in the Gaussian is the inverse of the Gaussian 
covariance times, I should be saying here, the sample covariance. So one over n, y transpose y is the sample covariance. I should have been clear about that. So that's the empirical estimate of the covariance of the data, right? Whereas C is the covariance of the Gaussian density. Yeah? So those are two slightly different things. By the way, if we were just fitting a general Gaussian, we would just set C equal to this. The maximum likelihood solution for a general Gaussian is C is equal to the sample covariance, but here C is constrained. We don't get to do that, right? Because C is this low rank form. So this constraint on the covariance is the key thing here, right? It's gonna come up again when we do Gaussian processes. Um, if all that's true, then the maximum likelihood solution where UQ is defined as the first Q principal eigenvectors of the sample covariance and the corresponding eigenvalues are lambda Q and there's some revision of eigenvectors and eigenvalues in the notes. Um, then W is equal to this matrix of the eigenvectors times this L. So this is the corresponding eigenvalues at lambda Q is a diagonal matrix, right? So it's a diagonal matrix of uh, eigenvalues where L is given by the eigenvalues minus sigma squared, the noise, all to the half. So you take those eigenvalues, subtract the noise, and you take the square root. And that times UQ gives you the first part of W, and R is just an arbitrary rotation. So you can't determine R. The reason you can't determine R, because, because imagine I've put an I in between W, W transpose. So there's an I matrix in here. W only appears in this form. Let me take an I out. I can factorize I into R, R, trans, R transpose R rotation matrices and you know also permutation. So it's a rotation permutation, really. Um, I'm a bit sloppy by saying it's a rotation. So I any, you know, the square root of I, there's infinite square roots of I. So there's infinite solutions for this. But um basically what we tend to do in principal component analysis is we just assume R is I, right? But strictly speaking, you can rotate this matrix W and permute. All. So we tend to order W in terms of principal eigenvector first, um, and uh, we tend to take this rotation to one, which, which then means that W comes out to be orthogonal. And everyone thinks principal components are orthogonal, but they're not. It's just by convention, I mean, that we choose that orthogonal thing. It's convenient, right? So I don't want to go through the details of this. They're in the notes. It was just if I'd gone a bit faster, then I would have gone through that um, to talk a little bit about, about, uh, about um, how the eigenvalue problem works in practice. Now, for some reason, this is slipped down here, and it was something I didn't get a time a chance to fix. But but basically, um, probabilistic PCA. This uh, this is just the maths that slipped down. The same maths you've just seen. Probabilistic PCA is a setup where we define a linear Gaussian relationship between the latent variables and the data. And then we take the standard uh, latent variable approach where we define a Gaussian prior over the latent space Z, right? So that was the missing thing that we didn't know. Why is there no one over N in the trace term from Herbie? Sorry, let me go back to that. Uh, see what you're saying here. Herbie on this part is saying there's no one over n here. Yeah, um, because that n's appearing from here, uh, you see where my pointer is on the log determinant. So what happens when you take the, um, let's just assume that we were, um, uh, it's a good question because you're sort of seeing the one over n. I, I guess what you're driving at is this isn't, this object here is, n times the sample covariance. You're quite right. Um, if you were to do the multivariate um, uh, calculus to differentiate with respect to C, what you get is um, the log of C term is, uh, um, if I remember well, it's going to be inverse of C when you differentiate with respect to C times n over 2. Um, and then this term here ends up a bit more complicated. It's like C inverse uh, y transpose yc inverse. Um, so if you multiply both sides by c, you end up with a form which is, so you've got that's your gradient, you're trying to set that to zero, you end up with a form that is of the form c 
minus y transpose, well, n over two times, minus n over two times c minus y transpose y. So the n is appearing when you divide it through by n, right? So, I mean, another way of seeing it, seeing it, Herbie, would be to say, just divide this whole thing by n at the start and this n goes missing, right? And, and then one over n appears here, but it's just appearing in the maximal likelihood. I mean, the same happens with the mean function. Uh, if you do maximal likelihood with respect to mean, the n comes from the, um, the uh, determinant term, which is the normalizer for the Gaussian. Cool, thanks for the question. Did, did, did I answer it to satisfaction? <laughs> Just double check there. Um, cool, thanks, Herbie. Um, so this is the standard approach where we're defining a Gaussian prior over that thing that's missing. And then we integrate out the latent variables, the things we don't know. And this is supposed to be just a little review of that. And this little graphical model is supposed to be showing that the X, oh, so it should be Z. Again, I had to cut and paste this. The Z here, um, which is determining Y is the missing thing. And we're maximizing with respect to W, which is in the black. Okay, so you've got in the notes, um, uh, a, a robot navigation example um, that you can play with if you wanna, you know, Obviously, it's not going to be marked, but if you're interested in this space and you know you've got a bit more time at the beginning of term, and you can do PCA on this robot navigation data. The fun thing about that is effectively you can interpret the PCA as um, the data itself is, and it's supposed to be a robot, but it was um, a student who was on the paper in the University of Washington walking around with a mobile phone, monitoring the strength of different Wi-Fi access points. So instead of having the um, rotation of the digit. The data here is the strength of 30 different access points as, and the student, instead of rotating, the student's walking around the department. So that's a multivariate data set that looks quite a lot like um, uh, rotation of six. But here, instead of a force rotation we're doing, this should all relate to the walk that the student did in the department. And it does, I mean, it's a linear system, so it doesn't all quite work because these are non-linear relationships, the relationship between your mobile phone and the access points. In particular, the phone that he was carrying only can store like five access points at any one time. So there's some horrible non-linearity as it looks at the signal strength of these access points, but starts dropping some. Um, but still, if you do PCA on that data set, you can basically see a representation of his walk, just like, you know, which is the latent space, just like we saw um, the representation of the rotation. So that's a fun data set to play with. There's another part to that and I want you to think about that. If you, if you take the design matrix and transpose it, and instead of doing um, the uh, PCA on the original matrix, you do PCA on the transposed matrix, you see a representation of where those access points are. Try and think about why that is. Right, so basically, so instead of saying the walk is the data points, you're now saying the different data points are the access point strengths and the features are the observations along the time of the walk. It's a really interesting thing to do. And in effect, we're gonna do it big time in a moment. So there's a few different interpretations of principal component analysis that you may have been introduced principal component analysis in a different way. This You may not recognize what I'm saying here. I assure you, this is the way Hotelling introduced it. He was the one that named it. Um, th the problem is that this algorithm, which is um, the decomposition of the covariance matrix into its eigen decomposition, is the solution to many different problems. So there's many other problems where I say, oh, I'm interested in, for example, what is the direction of maximum variance in a data set? And the answer turns out to be, do the eigen decomposition on the covariance matrix. Okay, fair enough. Then people say that's PCA. Well, it is and it isn't. I mean, it's PCA because the solution to this problem is the same, right? The solution to the problem is the same as the solution to PCA. So you might think, well, that means it's PCA then. Well, yes and no, because <clears throat> what happens is if I non-linearize these algorithms, if I do a non-linear version of what I've just been saying, so we're gonna do a non-linear mapping from latent to data. <clears throat> if I non-linearize that algorithm, 
I don't get the same answer as if I non-linearize an algorithm where I say, I'm interested in uh, the non-linear direction of greatest variance, right? That turns out to be a different, uh, well, they are different questions. And in this case, the answers are different. In the linear case, the answers are the same. But the reason why the answers keep being the same in the linear case is because the relative simplicity of what's going on, everything's matrix inner products. So everything seems to converge on this algorithm of a, a eigen decomposition, the covariance matrix, but that causes a lot of confusion. So I like to say, well, the PCA is this model, right? Now in practice, everyone else thinks PCA is an algorithm, which is the eigen decomposition of the covariance, but um, you know, that's not how Hertelling wrote it in 1933. So I'm sticking with it. And to go further, this separation between model and algorithm is very helpful conceptually to know what you're doing when you're building new algorithms or when you're trying to look at new data sets. So a, a data set where it becomes very interesting that um, I'll be looking at shortly is data set on um, uh, developmental data, gene expressions in developing embryos, right? If you are confused about what PCA is and you start trying to apply it in that type of context, you won't be able to build an algorithm that deals with all the type of confounders you're interested in. So in practice though, separating the model. So the model was the probability thing we wrote down. The algorithm in this case was the maximum likelihood answer. Separating the two is really important, but in practice, they will often conflate. So they, they definitely conflate in deep neural networks because deep neural networks is partially a model, but really a lot of what's going on is uh, the way you're choosing to fit those models is preventing you from overfitting um, because of double descent phenomena. So it's very hard to unpick the model and the algorithm in the neural network, they're integrated. And that turns out to often be a good idea for speed. That's why you can do such large data sets with them, right? But it's quite difficult to do the analysis. It's so difficult to pull them apart <clears throat> and do the analysis. I would also say, and this is just a, a sort of general point about machine learning in general, it's really interesting to go and look at algorithms and say, oh, well, what's the model that would imply that algorithm? And it's, it's, um, it's an underdetermined problem. There could be several models that imply that algorithm as we've just seen with PCA. But if you look at this domain of probabilistic numerics where they're looking at things like um, Runge-Kutta uh, equations for Runge-Kutta solutions for differential equations or a recent paper by Mark Girolami who's in engineering on reinterpreting finite element analysis as basically a big Gaussian process. Um, you're looking at <coughs> classical algorithms that have been used for a number of years and saying, oh, there's impl an implicit model here. And <coughs> we can use that implicit model to integrate data into the system. And that's what Mark's paper in PNAS is about uh, out this week. So that, that's a really nice example about that. That's very contemporary. So I do, I do think that this, I think uh, probably 10 years ago, we would have really hammered this home and say, you do the model, you do the algorithm separately. That's not what's going on in modern machine learning, but I would still argue that the, the conceptual separation of model and algorithm is very important. Okay, so I'm gonna skip these because we sort of done that. But, <clears throat> but we wanna be nonlinear. Oh, and apologies, I've switched from Z to X for the latent variable. I'm prone to doing that because I can't decide. Unlike, uh, unlike design matrices, I haven't taken a life decision on Z and X. I, I generally prefer X, but, but lots of other people prefer Z. So I, I sometimes use Z. So X is now the latent variable. So that what I really want to do is nonlinear. I said that at the beginning, right? You know, we were showing nonlinear dimensionality reduction, but everything I've showed you is linear. Um, so I want to do something like this, two dimensional grid being mapped to a three dimensional um, surface. And actually, by the way, this is the trick that um, sort of uh, the GTM uses is to actually turn to look at the grid itself, not to look at the um, whole surface. So this is a trick you can use for doing this. But it's quite hard. If I have a probability distribution in the X space, so imagine there's a Gaussian distribution here. When it moves into this higher dimensional space, it's, it's quite strongly distorted. Um, even if I take like this one dimensional thing, you also get these distortions between the gaps. So like if I do, um, I've got this one dimensional input here X and I'm mapping through, through with two nonlinear functions. And look, I mean, sometimes the gaps between points are large, sometimes they're small, it, it's really distorting. So even if I look at one, just a simple Gaussian here, 
and then I map it to a one dimensional space and I try and look at the corresponding distribution. This is now a sort of very complex multimodal distribution and it becomes intractable. So what do I mean by intractable? Well, in order to fit by maximum likelihood, you have to be able to integrate over the domain Y. And that's trivial in everything we did before because of those multivariate Gaussian rules. Like that's normally the biggest headache in all uh, probabilistic modeling is doing that integration, right? It's because it's typically here, it's a one dimensional, but it's typically a high dimensional integral. And you just can't do it analytically. And you end up having to do Monte Carlo sampling or a variational method or something like that. Um, well, as soon as we put a nonlinear function in here, if it's a general nonlinear function, that distribution is intractable. We can't compute its normalization. The log determinant term was the normalization, the one that we were discussing in answer to Herbie's question of the Gaussian. We just can't compute it here. So that means we can't do the maximum likelihood because we need that log determinant term in the maximum likelihood. So that's a bit of a headache. Okay, so this was like my first, well, one of my early career major innovations was to sort of notice this. So this is my trick. So I was lucky because I knew, you'll see my trick is just that you, you once you know Mike's tip trick, then you realize your, your trick works. Um, so PCA has this probabilistic interpretation, but it's difficult to non-linearize for the reasons we just gave. Um, there's these methods that, so actually I'm realizing this text is from older slides, also variational autoencoders would be non-linearizing that interpretation as well. Um, but this work goes way back like 2005, 2003, I think the first paper is. Uh, so this is an alternative probabilistic interpretation PCA and that's the thing that um, we're introducing for your um, R250 unit that we can make an interpretation, an alternative interpretation of probabilistic P of PCA. So I said that there's multiple models with the same algorithm. Well, we're gonna come up with a slightly different model that has the same algorithm. And the model we have turns out to be easy to non-linearize and the result is non-linear probabilistic PCA. Let me just pause there because I, I felt that I garbled that and I just wanna check where everyone is, if there's any questions. Maybe I didn't garble it. Or maybe you're all watching YouTube on the side. I don't know, it's hard to tell. But I'm just gonna assume that it's all fascinating. Uh, um, uh, no clarifications? Okay. So dual probabilistic PCA, and this is funny because I've tried to do this slide twice and in reveal, I've been mapping from old slides. That's why some of these things are messed up. And uh, it's done different errors in each case, but this error is easier to read. So again, uh, the X should be a Z, just like the previous slide. This is supposed to be compared to the previous slide. So, but it's knocked off my text on the side here, but I can explain the text. It's in the notes. The text is clear in the notes. That's the important thing. So in the original latent variable model, we um, optimized with respect to W and integrated out Z or X as it's shown here, but Z, right? But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to flip that all around. So what you're seeing here is this prior distribution, P of W, is over the parameters. And the likelihood is not P of Y given W, like it was in my tippings. It's P of Y given Z. So this, you should just be able to reconstruct this proof, given everything I've said so far, because it's trivial given the multivariate Gaussian properties, which I didn't use to write it in the first place. I'd used Sherman Woodbury formulas for ages to get to this answer, but it's so easy if you just remember multivariate Gaussian properties that basically this is saying the same as we said before, this is the same F of Z, right? That it's F of Z is just WZ as we see in the mean here, right? So F of Z is WZ. But instead of putting a prior over Z and then saying, oh, so our covariance is WW transpose plus sigma, we put a prior over W and now our covariance becomes ZZ transpose plus sigma. And this covariance is N by N and the product is independent across P. So different in a couple of ways, right? The original P of Y given W for probabilistic PCA product over N Gaussian over the rows of Y, 
zero mean covariance WW transpose plus sigma squared. This new model where I'm integrating over the parameters instead of the latent variables. Okay, that's the key thing I'm doing, integrating over the parameters instead of the latent variables, product over P output dimensions of Y columns. So remember design matrix. So before we were factorizing over the rows, now we're factorizing over the columns of Y. And the covariance matrix therefore has to be N by N and it's formed by an outer product of the latent variables, a matrix outer product. So this is a N by N, but it's of rank still Q. Just as before, the rank of this thing is Q. So this is a low rank factorization. I will pause there. Oh, we go. Are the ZI is still independent in this case. We haven't said actually Mengwei. Great point. And in fact, one of the exercises is, is um, later. We haven't said anything about Z. So when we optimize with respect to Z, we're doing max, just like in the last time, we didn't say anything about W. So one of the tricks you can do is anything you like on Z. So one of the papers I think I've asked you to read is the Gaussian process dynamical model, where um, the modification they make to the GPLVM, which is what we're building up to, is to assume that Z is, um, has the Markov property, that Z is a time series which is good, right, for the robot example we just spoke about. You can see why that's interesting. Um, and then they impose that as a map solution. So they don't, um, they don't integrate it out uh, like you would try and do. A great question, Mengwei. Yeah, so we haven't made an assumption. W, uh, this is deceptive, right, because W looks like it's this full covariance thing, independent over P. That's just to make the math easier. Of course, its covariance is I. So all the Ws are independent, just like all the Zs were, and they're sampled from um, uh, unit Gaussian in this case, just like the Zs were last time. But we haven't said anything about Z in this case, just like before we didn't say anything about W. Um, and people use that a lot in early GPRVM works. Thanks, Mengwei, great question. Other questions? We're gonna, we'll stop in about five minutes. So we'll get a chance for more questions then. Cause now it goes like rapidly like, oh, whoa, there's a load of new stuff. You'll be going like, why did he go so slow and then go so fast? Now, the beautiful thing is that um, this was my proof, right? So this is the wonderful proof that took 66 years to come up with the probabilistic PCA proof that Mike Tipping did. And Six years after he did that, while I was working on this model, I realized, oh my God, the proof is almost identical. So if I want to maximize with respect to Z instead of W in my new system, it's still an eigenvalue problem. But it's instead of being the eigenvalues on Y transpose Y, which is the covariance, and back to Herbie's question, I've dropped the one over N because it just scales everything, right? It just scales lambda Q, Herbie. So that's why I've dropped it here. Um, just because to keep it tidy. Because in fact, in this case, it becomes a one over P. Um, but basically these, the form of these two eigenvalue problems is the same. So this one is on an N by N uh, inner product matrix. So it's not the covariance matrix, it's the, what's called the inner product, product matrix or the gram matrix of uh, the data. Um, and you take the eigenvectors of that n by n matrix, and uh, they're not the same as these eigenvectors, but there's this close relationship between them. There's this equivalence that you can prove that the two things are exactly equivalent. And in fact, this equivalence is known in PCA. So if ever you do PCA on a data set where there's um, more features than data points, you should do this second eigenvalue problem because it's cheaper because these eigenvalue problems are order n well they're the size of this matrix there um if we if we call that m they're m cubed order so um if m is n then it's n cubed if m is p it's p cubed so which one you choose when you're doing pca is dependent on whether n is greater than p or less than if it's less than P, uh, you do this one. If it's greater than P, you do this one. Okay, so that's probabilistic PCA, that new algorithm I sort of developed. But also, it turns out that this object here is a Gaussian process. It's a linear Gaussian process. 
So now Gaussian process this year, I, I couldn't do it last year because we didn't have courses with GPs in so much. It's supposed to be prerequisite for doing this R250, but I'm not sure how cleanly that's been applied. So if you haven't done Gaussian process before, there's some notes introducing Gaussian processes. Um, and I've got a couple of just slides just to rush briefly through them. But the point is basically that this Z is the inputs now to a Gaussian process. So it's like, so at the beginning we said Y is equal to F of Z, right? And then we said, okay, but we're gonna say Y is equal to W times Z. And then we're saying, oh, I'm gonna put a Gaussian prior over W in this case, before we said, I'm gonna put a Gaussian prior over Z. Now what, if I choose instead of doing all that mess to just say, well, Y equals to F of Z, and I'm going to put a Gaussian process prior over f of z. And then I'm going to optimize this system here to get this solution. I optimize this likelihood with respect to z. In this new case, I'm just going to optimize the likelihood of the system with respect to the inputs to the Gaussian process, which is effectively the same thing we're doing here. But I'm allowing any Gaussian process in this case. Now, as a reminder, for those who've forgotten, a Gaussian process, so the Gaussian is a prior over parameters, a Gaussian process is a prior over functions. So when I talk about a process prior over f of z, if z was one dimensional, what I mean is I'm believing sets of functions like this exist, which is quite beautiful. I was at, I was at Aston University when I first saw these things, and I was at the Newton Institute when I first had a tutorial in them in Cambridge. And I tell you, it, it, it's so elegant, you know, that's kind of why I stopped working on neural networks. And I do a bit of stuff with neural networks now, um, occasionally, but I'm still, because they're so beautiful, Gaussian processes. Um, because you get these funky nonlinear functions, but you can have a distribution over them. And what does that mean? Well, here's my distribution over functions. Okay, here's very many functions sampled from that distribution. And here's some data. Now, Bayesian inference is basically the process of uh, find the functions that are my prior over functions um, that match the data. So what I'm doing is a simple approach to Bayesian inference where I'm sampling from that prior over functions. And now I'm gonna throw away all the data that doesn't go near the, all the functions that don't go near the data, right? That's just the process of Bayesian inference. And in fact, there's an algorithm called ABC that effectively does this to apply general prior distributions to data. Like you can have very, very complex prior distributions. The beautiful thing in the Gaussian process is you can do it all analytically by linear algebra. So what I'm showing you here is the, the bold, the yellow line, which may be harder to pick out, so I'll follow it here, is the mean of the posterior distribution over functions. And these error bars are giving you the variance of the posterior distribution. So you, and that's all analytic. It's n cubed in the data, which is a slight problem. Um, and lots of work is done to fix that, but it's analytic. So that's the Gaussian process. Um, and it's so it just summarized there, basically what I was just saying. And it's specified by a mean and covariance function. But again, we just drop the mean and assume it to be zero. And that's not a major problem. Um, but we do keep the covariance function. And the class of covariance functions is the same as the class, a class called Mercer kernels. Now, if you've done machine learning 10 years ago, and if you've done any courses on it, you would all know what a Mercer kernel is because kernel methods were so dominant. But now neural networks are dominant. Um, perhaps you don't know, but this is the object that's used in a support vector machine to do fitting there. Um, and the same thing is used in a Gaussian process. Um, but the basic idea is this is the kernel. So instead of before where we had K is ZZ transpose sigma squared I, what we do is we just substitute that with a general Gaussian process kernel. Now we can no longer um, optimize this analytically. We have to do gradient descent basic methods to optimize, but basically we now have a nonlinear approach to fitting these things. Okay, so I wanna, so here's like some, that's the, exponential quadratic covariance, which is widely used, that is used for creating this covariance function here. 
Now there's some examples in the notes. Um, I'm not gonna do the learning covariance functions from the data, but you can read that in the notes. But what I want to go through is, is to the sort of result of my favorite implementation of this. Um, so all of these allow you to sort of play with this in the notes using GPI. So the GPI software implements GPLVM, so you can play with that. One of the suggestions is to, um, uh, oh, is that going? here we go. One of the suggestions, oh, that didn't really go very full screen, did it? So let me find another version of that, is to um, uh, re-implement GPLVM type stuff in PyTorch. That's something that you could imagine doing. So I'm just going to get this video up you the sort of thing that this model can do and this is um, from a Eurographics in 2006 and it's like I think it's still my favorite ever application of GPLVM and bear in mind this is like well before um, variational autoencoders, GANs or anything else. Can you hear the sound? Chat if you can't hear the sound. Okay. Okay, so he's to introducing this model, which is called the latent doodle space. And how do I actually, it's a good point. Um, yeah, I mean, you can look at the video in the, uh, um, in the notes as well. But the idea is that he's creating a, um, set of images and those images are converted so each line in these images is um, converted to a set of features so each image is a data point and the data point itself is represented by um, a high dimensional space p um, and there's a series of lines in the data point right so like each of these faces is a data point, which is itself made up as a series of lines and each line is made up of a series of numbers. Um, now, there's a correspondence problem here, which causes some difficulty. So when you, when you build these lines, how do you know which line is supposed to map to which other line in each image, right? And that's the first thing he has to deal with. There's an amount of work in this paper to deal with that correspondence problem. But basically he's gonna fit the GPLVM to that data. So these are his three data points now. He's got four drawings at this head. And now he's fitted a GPLVM. Now watch, watch what happens. Because the, uh, there's something wrong with the, the nose and um, the correspondence isn't quite right. So he's fixing the correspondence in the images on the right. He's just telling which line corresponds to which. So that's not GPLVM, that's just, just to do with his feature representation. Um, so he's doing all those uh, fixes. He's still gonna have one fix after this, but so he's got four data points and look how he moves around this latent space can generate new data points. Something wrong with the nose, stroke directions are reversed. So he fixes that. Okay, and now watch now is that he's moving in this Z space and what you're visualizing is F of Z in the high dimensional space. And what you have, so this he fits, he's fitting the GPLVM every time he's doing this fix. It's very, very quick to fit for four data points. But you get this um, ability to extrapolate these different faces. I just love this. And this is four data points. So, you know, this just will not work with a variational autoencoder. So he's, he's created a probabilistic stamping tool um, to create a new random doodle. And in this case, he's, um, clicking the doodle and then moving the um, uh, mouse to sort of change the look. Uh, and these are all sort of, you know, in, they're interpolated and extrapolated from those original four drawings. So you might think that those drawings are quite sort of similar and it's not surprising it does an okay job, but the next example, okay, the scale and rotation isn't down to the GPLVM, that's obviously he can just do that um, on his feature representation. but he now moves to this um, different set, a different example where he's got these, uh, I guess, they three or four insects, five insects. 
And he's got the same correspondence problem, which I think looks so good when it goes wrong here. Look, it looks like Gary Larson drawings, if you've ever, you might not be familiar with Gary Larson. So he's just fixing the correspondence there. Um, just like we had the correspondence. Again, that's, I mean, actually there's now work on doing this automatically um, in the GPLVM. So it's like uh, trying to fix like the permutations of what should map to what. And the GPLVM like models can do it. Carl Henrik, who's at the department has done some work on that. Um, but here in these days, like 14 years ago, it had to be done manually. Um, by the way, like in the last financial crisis, like when I wasn't sure what the future was going to look like at all, I was convinced that I would, I would go, I would leave university and write an app based on this idea <laughs> to, to support myself if, if I got fired from being an academic. Okay, so now he's got the same thing. Look at he's just inventing um, little insects. Uh, and, it, and he can do the same thing he was doing before. And it ends, unfortunately, you, you won't hear the music because he's got some great music where he makes the um, bugs dance. It's like sort of, I don't know, it sounds like house music from the 1990s. Maybe not house music. You'd all know this better than me. But uh, he's just doing the like probabilistic stamping. And then he ends the video. This is Eurographics. This was accepted too. And, and they have to make these videos as part of the submission. So like in... <laughs> In my ears, rave music has now entered. So you have to imagine rave music as he, as he just does this. It's, it's the slow bit of the rave music now, as you can imagine. Yeah, and it just fades with him uh, making the bugs dance. Notice, by the way, the legs don't tie up, right? So the legs here don't tie up correctly to the body. It's because it only knows that they're correlated with the body. It's not imposing that as a constraint. So that, that's certainly, a, you know, if you were doing this in the real world, you would have to deal with that weakness. Well, we've got five minutes left for um, additional questions. So let me just stop sharing and stop.